what is true? And in that passage that was just read for us, Jesus himself says he came to bear witness unto the truth. And uh, Pilate responded with that question, what is truth? What is truth? Every Christian ought to believe in truth. And uh, in tonight's message, we're going to focus on the following three points. Number one, ultimate reality. Number two, a standard for belief. And then lastly, the Bible can be understood. There's a, a way of thinking which has become popular in our world today, and it's often referred to as postmodernism. And if you know nothing about postmodernism, it's, it's, it's the basic idea that there is no such thing as truth. That's the, that's the core claim of this way of thinking that people will refer to as postmodernism. There is no such thing as truth. And it really is dreadful how popular uh, this teaching has become. And it's even made inroads into uh, the church. You see, when you abandon the idea of truth, there, there's certain things you, you begin to say and certain ways you begin to, uh, to think. You know, if there is no truth, there is no authority or standard for what we believe, for what we practice as Christians, or for anything for that matter. Right? If, there's, if there's no truth, then really nothing we do is, is good or bad or is, is a, uh, something we can hold to some kind of objective standard. It's all just um, personal. And Christians who have adopted a no-truth way of thinking will say things along the following lines. Uh, well, you have your interpretation of what the Bible says, and I have my interpretation of what the Bible says. And uh, not necessarily, necessarily anything wrong with that. You know, if someone says something I believe is false concerning the Bible, you know, I, I might say something like that. But oftentimes people will say this, you have your interpretation, I have mine, with the idea that even though what we're saying is in contradiction, both interpretations are valid. Uh, both are good, even though they cannot uh, be in harmony. Um, those who will, again, adopt a no-truth way of thinking will say that a believer's conscience takes priority over the Bible, right? As long as you don't violate your conscience, uh, that's what matters, right? Not, I mean, if you violate scripture, you know, that's not a big deal. Just don't violate your conscience. And uh, nothing is ever a matter of doctrine. It's just always a matter of opinion. And uh, if someone is convinced that there is an issue, a doctrinal issue, a commandment in the Bible, then a common cop out they will use, well, you know, time and culture, Right? I know what Jesus said about marriage. I know what we read about regarding worship in the New Testament. Uh, but you know what? That was in their time and their culture. Uh, we live in a different time and different culture. So yeah, that was a command back then. Uh, but things are different for us. And so again, even if something is considered doctrinal, uh, a lot of times it will be rejected because of that, that kind of time and culture excuse. We ought to know that the message of the Bible rises above time and culture. It rises above the opinions of individuals because it is true. Right? The Bible claims that what it contains is the truth. And if that is true, right, the truth does not change. Uh, the, the truth is eternal. Um, and so let's begin with that first point tonight, ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. Every worldview uh, we might say every belief, right? Every belief system, uh, it has some, some uh, core belief about ultimate reality, some view regarding ultimate reality. And that phrase, ultimate reality, it refers to the foundational nature of existence. It's the idea of what is real, right? At the core of everything, what is unchanging? What is reality? And again, people have different answers to, to this question. For example, the person who believes in a naturalistic worldview will say ultimate reality is nature, right? Naturalistic nature. So they just believe everything's physical. And uh, that's, 
That's all there is. They claim there is no God. And, and naturalism is often the, the philosophy or the worldview adopted by atheists. Um, there, are, there are some exceptions to that, but usually if someone's an atheist, it means they're a naturalist. Um, they claim, the naturalist claims that there's no God, there's no kind of transcendent power, there's no spirit, not even a human spirit, that everything's just matter, right? We're just atoms, right? There's, there's no immaterial part of a human being. So what is a human being if we're just physical and nothing else? Well, there's an atheist named Patricia Churchlin, and she's become famous for the phrase moist robots. And what is, what is a human being if we don't have a soul, if we don't have a spirit? Well, again, according to this woman, we're moist robots, right? We're just robots. That's it. Uh, we're just a machine, nothing else. Uh, we're just physical. Um, this, of course, is not the Christian view of reality, of ultimate reality. Uh, according to the Bible, there is a God. He is the supreme being who transcends the physical world. And furthermore, we as human beings, of course, we are physical, right? That is part of what we are. But the Bible teaches there's also an immaterial part of, of a human. And uh, the following verse encapsulates this idea. 2 Corinthians 4.16 here Paul says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, notice he says the inward man, right, for the ladies, the inward woman, uh, is renewed day by day. And so Paul and again, the, the people who wrote the Bible understand, yes, we're physical. And, and as we get older, this, this outward body we have, it grows old, it perishes. But there's another part of us that is renewed every day. An unseen part, an immaterial part. Again, the Bible's word for that would be the, the spirit, the human spirit, the soul. And so the Christian ought to conduct himself in such a way that reflects a belief in God. Not only do we believe God exists, but we also believe that he has communicated to humanity. And this communication is what we call the Bible, right? The Holy, the Holy Bible. So again, we believe that ultimate reality is, is God, uh, is not the physical, but the spiritual, uh, that God has existed for eternity. He is unchanging and everything, even the physical things that we believe exist today, all this has come from, from him. And this creator uh, has revealed his, his will in the Bible. And so this is a number two, a standard for belief. A standard for belief. And again, I phrase it this way because when you consider what other people believe in the world, they often will follow some other standard. Not this, but something different. Again, just as different worldviews have different ideas about ultimate reality, they also have different ideas about what standard a person ought to follow. And in the religious world, in the denominational world, uh, there are plenty of uh, unique church traditions, again, traditions which would be in conflict with other personal traditions. Uh, people believe in creeds invented by uninspired men, uh, modern prophecies uh, made by men who are devoid of the Holy Spirit, um, literature and uh, books people will claim are, are holy books, are inspired books. Uh, the Mormons have... Uh, what they call um, another testament of Jesus Christ. So they claim to believe in the Bible, but they also claim to believe in a whole slew of other books that they believe are inspired as well. And so there are people who will follow, again, literature and books other than the Bible. And some of the folks will claim that those books they believe in are inspired books. Um, some people just follow their, their feelings, right? Their personal desires and feelings and uh, make choices just based off of, off of that. And there are all kinds of standards that people will use regarding how they make choices, how they conduct themselves, regarding their, uh, their beliefs. Um, earlier I mentioned postmodernism. Uh, postmodernism, again, is the denial of truth. And so people who deny truth consequently deny any kind of objective standard that a person ought to follow. 
right? How can you say you ought to do this if nothing's true, right? How could I say it's a good idea and I would, I would commend for you to follow, follow this if you believe nothing's true? You don't believe this is true. You don't believe anything is true, right? And so again, those who believe in postmodernism uh, really don't think about any kind of standard. And again, I think this has influenced our, our culture so much and uh, I know I've talked about this a little bit in past sermons, but if you ever have some free time and you'd like to do some reading, uh, I would encourage you to read a little bit about postmodernism because I believe it has affected us so deeply as, um, as a country. Uh, why is it certain people in our culture are hell-bent on following and promoting the idea that a healthy, normal man can become a woman. I mean, that's a popular thing nowadays. And vice versa. You know, a woman can, can become a man. Well, I think it starts with a denial of truth, right? You have to deny reality. You have to deny facts to get to that extreme point where you would not only believe that yourself, but then start to promote it and uh, try and encourage other people to follow that kind of idea. So not only is denying the existence of truth unbiblical, of course, but it is uh, irrational. It's simply irrational, right? And we don't need to use the Bible to try and uh, show people just how, um, again, irrational it is to, to believe in this kind of claim. In the claim, there is no such thing as truth is a self-contradictory statement because it is itself a truth claim, right? Put a little different by asserting that truth does not exist. That statement contradicts itself because it's claiming to be a true statement, right? You know, someone comes along, well, there is no truth. Well, should I believe you? Is that true? Because you're saying it as if it's true. You know what I mean? So again, it's, it's self-refuting. It's self-contradictory. And uh, the gender issue that had has uh, that some people are so obsessed with in our in our current time uh, this is i think one of the extreme results of this way of of thinking um, we ought to know that every law which exists in our country i'm talking i'm just talking about the laws of the land here right whether it's the speed limit or views about uh, capital punishment or whatever it is every law in our country exists because of some kind of moral belief, some kind of moral standard, every single law. And I mention that because there are folks in our country who will get upset with Christians, who will get upset with conservatives, um, because we want to put an end to the practice of abortion is one, one law we would like to change. Um, and people will say things like, well, you have no right to force your morality on me, on others, and so on. You have no right to force your morality on us. However, and I encourage you to mark this well, those who are in favor of abortion are forcing their morality on the unborn children in our country. And so the issue is never, you know, well, let's just stop enforcing morality. Because again, that's, it's impossible. If we're gonna have laws, every law reflects some kind of moral belief, right? Uh, can, I think most <coughs> rational people think murder is wrong. Even people, again, who don't necessarily believe in the Bible. Well, again, that's why when you go to any country, you can't just murder people. <laughs> I mean, it's against the law. Well, that's a moral belief. It's bad to kill people. Um, but for some reason, if that person is inside the womb of a mother, well, that's a whole different story all of a sudden for again, some irrational reason. So again, the, the issue is let's, not stop, let's stop enforcing morality. The, the question is, the issue is, well, whose morality are we going to enforce? And uh, if you think about how things have changed in our, our country um, in the past, I think, I would say 70 years or so, um, the laws in our country have changed significantly regarding marriage and divorce, regarding the sanctity of human life, uh, regarding the recreational use of certain drugs, 
and several other, uh, I think, important issues. Well, why? Why have things changed? And I'm not saying, you know, if someone believes it's good or bad, obviously things have changed. Why have things changed? And one answer is uh, a secular morality is being forced upon us. Um, our country has grown cold in its faith, and people, in, uh, because of that, people because of that, have elected politicians and leaders uh, who really don't care about the Bible, uh, who really have no respect or fear of God, and they're going to make laws and pass laws based on what the populace wants. And so whatever may happen regarding our, our country and the laws that are passed, we as Christians have a standard that we are instructed to, to follow, a standard which rises above the laws of men. And of course, that standard is the Word of God. And of course, we're never going to follow it flawlessly, right, to err as human. We make mistakes. But it ought to be our goal. It ought to be every believer's goal to do uh, his best to follow what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches truth exists, and it has been revealed. It's been revealed, and it's been passed on to humanity. It's been uh, passed on in due order. And uh, it's interesting, we look at, look at the Bible, the, the whole Godhead plays a role in Revelation, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, God the Father revealed many things in the Old Testament. And one of, again, the more, most important um, revelations in the Old Testament is that the Messiah is coming and that he's going to be our sacrifice. He's going to be our substitutionary sacrifice. Uh, he's going to take upon himself the punishment a sinful world deserves. And in that we can have freedom and we can have eternal life. And uh, when the appointed time came, Jesus the Messiah uh, arrived in the New Testament uh, it says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, Galatians 4, verse 4. And so the Messiah, the Christ, he came at the fullness of time, in the time that God appointed and revealed in the Old Testament. And one of the things we should know is when Jesus was living in this world, uh, Jesus did not claim that his, his teachings came just from himself from his own volition. Instead, he would say things like the following, and he made these kinds of claims uh, quite frequently. Um, here in John 14, verses 23 through 24, Christ says here, um, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word, notice this highlighted portion here. He says, the word which he hears is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And uh, Jesus often made this claim. You know, what I'm teaching, what I'm sharing with you, this isn't my word. This is the Father's word. So he's claiming that his message came from uh, God the Father. Um, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Acts chapter 1. I'd like us to read from the beginning of Acts chapter 1. Uh, again, Jesus lived in this world you know, approximately 33 years. And in the in approximate three years of his ministry, uh, he taught frequently, he preached to people frequently. And he promised that when he left, eventually left this world, right, he, he died and was resurrected, then he ascended to the Father, he left this world, that the apostles would carry on his, his teachings. His, his teachings would be committed to these special men called the apostles. And uh, they would continue to uh, teach the word of Christ. It would be their responsibility to disseminate uh, his teachings. So Acts 1, I'd like us to start with verses uh, 1 and following here. Acts 1 verse 1. It says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After, uh, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles, notice it says here, whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself 
alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Um, and as you keep reading there, uh, especially in verse 5 and verse 8, uh, Jesus promised that the apostles would receive the Holy Spirit. And it's worth noting, uh, he's not promising, making this promise to all the men in the church. He's not making this promise to any of the women in the church. I know that's not politically correct, but look at what he says. The apostles whom he chose, as far as I know, he never chose a female as an apostle. Um, it was these special men uh, who would receive the Spirit, and that would enable them to preach and teach accurately everything Jesus had, had shared with them in the past during his, his earthly ministry. Um, if you look at verse 8, uh, verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is coming, uh, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the outline for the book of Acts, if you read it. Uh, he starts, if I could go back here. Uh, the apostles start in Jerusalem. If you read Acts 2, the Holy Spirit empowers them, right? They begin to speak foreign languages and uh, preach and teach in these other languages so people can understand the gospel. It uh, starts in Jerusalem. Again, it spreads throughout Judea and then Samaria. As you keep reading, Acts 10 and 11, uh, Gentiles are fully included in the church in Acts 10 and 11. And the gospel begins to, to spread out from there. Um, and so we see, uh, again, this uh, revelation of God being uh, passed down step by step. Right? God the Father in the Old Testament, um, Christ in the New Testament, Christ giving it to the apostles. And uh, it was, again, the apostles' job to teach the church. And convey this word to other faithful individuals who would carry it on. <clears throat> Consider Paul's words to Timothy in the Apostle Paul. And he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And of the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. And notice he says to Timothy, uh, the same... Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 1 and 2. So again, this is, this is one of our duties uh, as Christians. That we ought to make an effort to pass, pass on the teachings of the New Testament to the next generation. To, to faithful uh, men. So God's revelation was entrusted to faithful men. And again, it's up to us to know it, practice it. And disseminate it. God the Father entrusted his will to Christ. Again, Christ uh, never said regarding his teachings that they're just mine. He said, what you hear is the Father's word. Then Christ promised through the power of the Holy Spirit, the apostles would receive that same word. And that's what, again, that's what we see in Acts, is the apostles now going throughout the world, sharing the gospel with the, with the world. So the Bible is the standard that we follow. And uh, that's you know, very obvious for us, but again, we have to understand we interact with people, uh, people who are outside of the church. Now, there's some people in the religious world who will claim they follow the Bible, and maybe they do to a certain extent. But there's, again, folks out in the world who, could care, who couldn't care less about what the Bible says. Again, they're following something else, right? They're following popular ideas, different religions or philosophies. And so that's something we need to keep in mind is, is the standard we live by uh, is different from what, uh, what exists in the world and other standards people um, follow. And let me just quickly say in this final point, and I'll keep this uh, final point uh, short and sweet, the Bible can be understood. And again, I just want to keep this short because I've actually preached an entire sermon not too long ago about the Bible being understandable. Um, yes, there are passages in the Bible which are difficult, right? Revelation is a very difficult book to understand, right? If you just read through it, a lot of wonderful things you can glean from just sitting down and reading through it. 
But when you really want to you know, pick out the details, what exactly does that mean? Sometimes the answer is just, I don't know, right? The secret things belong, belong to God, and you just got to do your best. There's definitely some difficult things uh, to understand the Bible. Um, Peter himself, an inspired man, talks about this. Uh, in referring to the writings of Paul, uh, Peter says this in verses 50, uh, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. And notice he says here, and which are some things hard to be understood. Right? So Peter himself said that. There's some hard things to understand in Paul's writings. Uh, but then he goes on and he says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. As they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. And so even regarding passages which are difficult to understand, and there are difficult passages, there are difficult books like the book of Revelation would be one. So even regarding difficult things, we can have a view of those difficult passages and those difficult books which agrees with everything else the Bible says. Um, instead of contradicting you know, plain and simple, easy passages. Um, notice concerning these, these difficult portions of the Bible, uh, Peter says here that there are certain people who rest them, right? Who uh, twist them to their own destruction. And if you look up this word in, in the original language, rest or twist, uh, it literally carries with it the idea of torture. They torture the Bible and they will use uh, passages which are harder to understand to try and, and pass off and teach messages which aren't, which aren't true. Um, and so we should be aware of people doing that kind of thing. Um, and so again, these passages which can be difficult, uh, we can still understand them in a way which they fit with the rest of the Bible. And uh, notice carefully the two terms in verse 16, unlearned and unstable. He speaks about those who are unlearned and unstable. You know, put another way, those who are ignorant and those who are ill-established in the Word of God. And the Word of God here condemns those who are unlearned and unstable. And this is one of the many reasons we can know the Bible is, can, as a general principle, it is understandable. Right? What's the point of any book if, if you can't read it and understand something from it? Right? You know, when we open up the Bible, it's not just a bunch of gobbledygook. Right? It's stories, it's teachings, and again, by and large, it's written to be understood, just like any book is written to be um, understood. And so instead of being unlearned and unstable individuals, we ought to be the very opposite. Um, our goal ought to, to be knowledgeable. Right? Not that we're going to know everything perfectly, but we ought to desire to have a good knowledge of God's Word and be stable in the Word of God. Um, towards the end of John's Gospel account, um, he has written the following, John 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. And so not only can we read this record of Jesus' life, but we can understand it in such a way that it produces belief in Jesus. It produces trust in Jesus. And we don't know everything about Jesus. You know, John, John tells us there's lots of other things Jesus did, right? But they're not written in, in his book. And I'd say that's true for all the gospel accounts. We don't have every you know, little detail about Jesus' life. There's large portions of his life, basically his childhood, that are, are mentioned once or twice in Scripture and, and done so quickly. And what's been preserved, what's been written down, has been given for us as, as evidence. So we can look at this record, we can look at the other biblical records, and we can have faith in Jesus. The Bible as a whole can be read and understood by the person who has the desire to read it and understand it. Again, that's what has to be there. Uh, in Romans 1.16, that famous verse about the gospel says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
For it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Bible is the authority that we must constantly rely on. We rely on it because we believe it's true. We rely on it because it is God's power for salvation. Right? For every single person. Right? Everyone who will believe. The Bible is the unchanging standard that we can always go back to. You know, if the teachings of a preacher ever let you down or disappoint you, if the oversight of an elder has ever disappointed you, uh, even if an entire congregation has apostatized and started promoting false teaching, don't allow the mistakes of others to ruin your faith. And I, I've heard that happen, you know, in the past, you know, a preacher, you know, gets caught up in adultery or something like that, does something he should never do, right? And a lot of people will basically leave the church because of that. You know, I've been listening to this person that, you know, uh, well, if that's what the church is. I, I don't want anything to do with the church. You know, same kind of thing I've heard happen with elders. And again, even complete congregations that have just gone some other way and stopped following uh, the Bible. Um, don't allow the mistakes of others to ruin your faith. Uh, our faith ought to be invested in one person, and that's Jesus. Not a preacher, not an elder, not a specific congregation. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do not change. Their word does not change. And you know, God forbid when a preacher, an elder, or a church, or whatever, when they abandon the truth... We ought to be literate enough in the truth that we can see, yeah, they've made a mistake, but that's not going to affect my faith in Jesus. Because this, again, this doesn't change. This stays the same. And so whatever you face in life, you can always return to the Bible, and in it, uh, in it you can find the truth. And so if there's anyone here this morning, this morning, this morning somewhere, uh, anyone here this evening who is not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, we encourage you again to follow what he taught. And uh, again, if you don't know, it's always there. It's always there. It doesn't matter what I say. It's always there. And uh, you can know for, for yourself. But I do believe and I'm convicted that he teaches. Again, you must believe in him. Repent from dead works. Uh, confess your faith in him. And then put him on in baptism as, uh, as he himself commanded. And then doing that, you rise up from that watery grave to become his, uh, to be his disciple. Set free from sin. And so if there's anyone here tonight who's not yet done that, uh, we do have a baptistry here. We can aid you in doing that. Um, and if we can offer prayers or encouragement for anyone, please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.